Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, July the 4th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Our first guest is Andrew Suresh Kumar, and we're going to be talking about a few different things, and we're going to start off with something that we've all been paying for a long time, but is something we're paying less now, which is MSP. Yes. Thanks for having me here, Jack. Uh, yes, so MSP, um, so I'm um, an immigrant from Malaysia, moved here in 2012, just a uh, small uh, introduction about myself. So when I came here and I uh, noticed that, you know, I, we had to pay for MSP, uh, a monthly payment that we had to commit ourselves to, to pay for medical and, you know, everything's covered, which is great. And uh, you pay and everything's fine. And then I find out that every other province in Canada actually does not pay for um, a, um, a kind of a medical payment, right, so to speak. And a lot of people here, I mean, it's kind of in the back of our mind, but people here don't even know it. I was surprised a few years ago when I heard it. It's, it's we're the only province. Exactly, we are the only province. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and all were one of the last ones to get out of it. But, like, they have got out of it many years ago, according to a lot of my Canadian friends. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of weird that we are the second most profitable, uh, third most profitable uh, province, yet we still pay MSP. I just don't... And uh, a lot of the MSP collection goes to general revenue, too, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, it doesn't go 100% to, towards medical. Um, then why pay, you know? And for a lot of people uh, who are at the lower end of the income spectrum, it is a lot of money that, you know, it, it really is, uh, you know, in tough times. And for a lot of people, it is tough times. It's not easy to pay that, uh, that amount every month. Yes. Yeah. And it seems easier for people in the higher bracket of things because the companies actually uh, pay for the MSP. Yeah. And which means they're actually well off compared to uh, the average person or like, um, you know, um, a person who uh, is just working a reg regular job, right? In BC, the people who are at the bottom of the income ladder really get hammered, you know, uh, and it's done to give tax breaks to the people at the top. That's, uh, that's the way British Columbia works as far as I can tell. So and the people at the bottom in many ways, and MSP payments is one of them, mm -hmm. really get I'm happy that uh, after the new government came in, like, you know, there, there is change, although I, I did also kind of learn a bit about provincial politics that actually the previous government started this movement to kind of uh, slash the payments in half and then later probably even slash it all together. But I'm hoping that that, that can be uh, done and, you know, whatnot, because it is kind of a it's not even a uh, it's not even a services plan it's more of like a tax or like a payment you pay for like something that i think is a basic uh, amenity that every uh, british columbian citizen should have yeah and we should have uh, access to i mean we don't even have access to health care in a lot of cases i mean if people need help they very often have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait to see a doctor if they even have a family doctor mm -hmm. And then a lot of the treatments are, uh, they seem to be more to benefit the pharmaceutical industry than to benefit those of us who may be ill and have, yeah, it, it's the whole healthcare system is, to my way of looking at it, a little bit weird and could really use a lot of fixing up as with so many other things in, yes. in the province. Um, yeah, on the family doctor topic, like um, talking with a lot of my Canadian friends, it's like kind of, um, the MSP system actually works against uh, the doctor's interests in terms of like trying to really uh, work here as a doctor and like um, another thing that I've heard is like uh, because MSP is kind of like a coupon payment type of uh, system so it's like the more patients they see the more payments they would get yes. and so they don't really treat the patients they just see them quickly and also, uh, it's more beneficial for a doctor to practice medicine in, uh, in a different province than in BC because of the MSP. So the MSP is kind of a crutch. I just don't know exactly how um, it all adds up to or like how the, uh, the whole framework actually uh, impedes doctors from coming here. But I 
we hear less of a shortage of doctors in other provinces than BC, that's for sure, right? Interesting. So BC has got a massive shortage of doctors, not uh, other provinces, more, so to speak. And I think it's uh, kind of correlated to the MSP, because that's the only factor here. Yeah, the way it's done. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about the cost of living in British Columbia, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people are... Um, I mean, for a lot of people, depending especially on your stage of life and whether or not you happen to own a house, um, the cost of living seems to be getting completely out of control. Yes, the cost of living, uh, the housing is a very hot topic because, you know, the numbers are staggering. But even uh, the small stuff like uh, gas prices, prices for milk or like, any, or like even every, the daily items that we buy, it's the B BC pays the, uh, like for, a, for a province that generates a lot of revenue from all sorts of uh, industries. We pay a fair big chunk of money to just for regular groceries compared to other provinces. So you mean groceries are higher priced in BC? Slightly higher than in, like say if you buy in Ontario, you're, it's much cheaper. I wouldn't say as way cheaper than like, uh, you know, go, doing grocery shopping in the States. Yeah. The States is the cheapest. Really cheap. Yeah, it's very cheap. But like, um, you know, you go to Ontario and you, you, you shop or you, you, you know, put gas in your, in your vehicle right now. It's like, it's not $1.50. It's like they're paying $1.30 right now for their gas. $1.20, $1.30. And their groceries are cheaper there, housing is cheaper there, everything is just way cheaper there. And um, it's not like we are not self-sustaining and we don't have any industry or resources or revenue. We have quite a, a lot of revenue as well. But I think the 80s and the 90s, like the BC government has struggled and, um, you know, to try to revitalize the housing market, they give all sorts of visas and people move here and you know they move with the with the uh, correct legal framework nothing is illegal but you know because of that the flooding of the housing market and, and whatnot and now house prices are so expensive and all of this just to make quick money you know and like well, I've watched the housing thing almost from the beginning and the way I see it is the the housing industry uh, the builders and the land companies who own the land, uh, working together with all levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, have deliberately created a huge housing bubble in Canada. Um, they've done it by underbuilding housing, by not building any rentals, so people are forced into rentals. I mean, for, people are forced into buying because you can't rent and then allowing the whole world to come in and speculate on our housing. Prices were going up 10% a year, so then you tell the whole world, hey, look, buy a house in Vancouver, buy a house in Victoria, it's going up 10% a year. At the same time, if you put your money into a European bank, a lot of the European banks were paying negative interest rates. So, and you know, it's, why our government did this to us to benefit the people at the very top who are making fortunes out of this because if you're, you know, not a lot of companies own a lot of land in many of our cities. And if that land doubles and triples in price, well, aren't they happy? And then the developers, why sell a condo for $100,000 when you can sell the same condo for $300,000 just because there's a shortage? So big money is being made and people are getting killed. And, and our governments, which should be, you know, trying to help us out here, they're working right with those people. It's, it's a nightmare. Yeah. And they sell uh, the idea that, you know, you buy now and then your, your property will be worth tenfold because of the way things are going. And that shouldn't be the way, especially for a first-time buyer, right? Because yeah. you're trying to get a basic home. Yeah, I mean, housing, we're the second biggest country in the world with a population of only 35 million people. Housing should not be expensive, but it's a game. It's a casino that a lot of people are doing, you know, the people at the top are doing very, very well in. And and uh, the damage they're doing to our society because the entire homelessness crisis comes out of that as well. There's just nowhere for people to live. So the people at the bottom are on the street. It's a crazy situation. We were going to also talk a little bit about comparing Malaysia and Canada. Oh, yeah. Uh, Malaysia and Canada is, uh, is not very different uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, 
got to where we are in terms of uh, we were both British colonies. We also have uh, bilingual um, national languages. Uh, in Malaysia, it's English and Malay. Malaysia as the national language and English more of the business language, but everything's advertised in two languages, just like here. So, um, Everybody so learns English in school then? Yes, yeah. English is a compulsory subject, uh, same as Malay. Uh, English is, uh, science is taught in English and math, uh, in, in science and math as well. Is, uh, English is used f uh, as the medium of uh, the medium language. Um, so in that sense, you know, I kind of uh, feel that, you know, that connection, right? That, you know, you, s you see everything in two languages and, uh, and everything is, uh, yeah, that, that it's not so foreign, right? It's not 100% like weird. Well, Canada's bilingual, but unlike you, I only speak one of the languages, so, <laughs> and a lot of us do, sadly. Right. Um, I mean, it's not all Malaysian. All Malaysians know Malay, but uh, the command of English uh, varies um, between, uh, you know, if, if you're in the city or if you're in a smaller town, then people will speak more Malay than English. So that's where the... What the are the big is. businesses in Malaysia or the big industries that people work in? The, industri uh, the biggest industry in Malaysia is oil and gas. So we have uh, a lot of oil and gas, but not as much as like Canada or um, the, uh, the, Gulf, uh, the Gulf countries or like South America and all. But we have uh, about 70% of our industry or 60% is about oil and gas. And we also do explorations in other countries as well. One, one country is Canada as well. Oh, right. So right. for LNG, yeah. So we do uh, join ventures and we, and, we, uh, and we partner with other countries and then we have certain percentages of, of, their, of the uh, raw materials or uh, the processed materials. So that's one. Also, um, the oil and gas in Malaysia, found in Malaysia, is also in very high quality. So unlike the uh, Gulf Islands that come up, uh, sorry, the uh, Gulf countries that come up with oil and gas that, are, that require a lot of uh, processing. Malaysia doesn't need much processing because it's low in sulfur and plumbum. Oh. So it's mostly used for aviation and high qualities, um, like, you know, um, rocket fuel and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so we don't use our own oil and gas, but we, we import, but we sell our oil. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I get it. Right, Most, right, right. So for cars, you can... Because our oil, oil and is, right, right. Uh, our petroleum is worth And more. Malaysia just did something great, which I think all Canadians should aspire to. <laughs> and that is the... F and this happens in a lot of countries. It just happened in South Korea as well. The former prime minister was arrested. Yes. And uh, what, were, what were the charges? Do you know? Um, it's not 100% clear exactly what the charges are, but basically um, the biggest scandal in, in, uh, in Malaysia is whereby 2.6 billion ringgit, or that's the equivalent of 700 million US dollars, was banked into the Prime Minister's personal bank account. And it was whistleblowed by a couple of people. There were some murders that happened in Malaysia that was high-profile murders where no one Tied could, into that? Yeah, no one could link to that because no one knew why. And then later when this thing got whistleblowed by, um, by a, uh, a, a private news vendor called um, Sarawak Report. Oh, yes, the, yes. Uh, I did check it out. Very interesting. Yeah, so they actually um, whistleblowed... Only one the, minute left. Yeah, they actually uh, whistleblowed the, uh, the whole story and, uh, and that's where it got snowballed into this and that's also the reason why 60 years of in, in, we had independence since 1957 uh, from the British and since then we only had one party that was ruling Malaysia uh, always got voted in and you know the same um, you know money politics uh, religious politics racial politics were all used to keep them in power but after 61 years everyone is sick and tired of this and especially um, you know, this scandal hit the nail on the coffin. Well, I hope you will in the future have a much, much better government, and I hope the same for us. We can all use better governments. Andrew, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. I'm Walt McGinnis, and uh, today we're going to be talking about. Uh, the new developments around the wireless technology that's happening in our in our society, namely uh, what's called 5G, which is uh, the fifth generation of uh, 
so-called improvements and upgrades with the wireless industry and, and what we're going to be seeing coming into our homes. So I have with me today uh, Sharon Noble. Sharon's the director of the Coalition to Stop Smart Meters in British Columbia. And also she's uh, done lots of research on all sorts of aspects around what's going to be happening with this wireless technology. So welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you very much, Walt. So I guess we just have to have a quick overview of what this technology is and how is it going to be affecting people? Well, right now there's, there's a lot we know, there's a lot more we don't know about 5G. Yeah. What we do know is that this is going to be something that is going to be dangerous and it's going to be closer to our homes than ever. People need to know that right now they have transmitters outside their homes or they will shortly. Little tiny boxes, probably about this size, about 15 or 18 feet high, up on a hydro pole or a telephone pole, yeah. just a few feet from your home. This, trans this technology is replacing the cell towers that we see that are on, you know, that are being erected. And the excuse is saying that it's going to be more aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. Really what it is, it's going to replace those because it's bringing in potentially milliwave uh, technology. Right now we use microcell technology. That is the length of the wave. And this is what's used in 3G and 4G. That's third generation and fourth generation. Yeah. We know the health hazards of, associated with that. You've talked about it a lot. I've talked a lot about it. This is what's in smart meters, Wi-Fi, cell phones. And we know that the health dangers are severe and significant and proven. Mm -hmm. The 5G is going to be using a lot of this um, lower frequencies, probably in the 700 to 900 range, but also they're going to be using milliwave technology, which so far has only been used by the military. It is being used as a weapon to tr control crowds. These are very, very short waves, and they're far less powerful. They can't penetrate buildings as well. They can't travel as far. So it requires these transmitters to be put every 100 to 200 meters. They're along the street. They're right. going to be sh sending signals everywhere. It's going to make it virtually impossible for anything living to escape them. Now we saw like in Brentwood Bay, uh, TELUS has installed a, a, a network there. Uh, and if we go online, and I'm going to give Will the URL for it, uh, people can go online and actually see uh, a graphic uh, drawing of all the towers that are in Brentwood Bay now, and it's quite astonishing. Now, the thing is, is that at the time when it was going in, TELUS communicated with me and said uh, that we're going to upgrade your system and we're going to be bringing fiber optic cable into your house. Yes. So how does that all fit into this picture? Well, it's very clever. They're telling you they're bringing fiber optic to your home. They will bring fiber optic to your home. But really what they're doing is bringing fiber optic up the street yeah. because it's the backbone of this 5G technology. Once they bring the fiber optic to your home, you still don't have fiber optic in your home. Yeah. You've got it to your home and they're expecting you to use Wi-Fi transmitters to continue with your Wi-Fi. So you'll end up with a wireless op uh, or a fiber optic cable to your router. Yes. And then from there going wireless. Well, or to your wall. Okay. Or to your wall. Yeah. That's what they did in our home. Yeah. I have everything wired. As you know, I yeah. know the dangers of wireless. We've never had anything wireless in our home. But I was excited to see the, fi the fiber optic cable. I called everyone in TELUS and asked them, you know, what's the gimmick? Will everything be wired? Yes, because I was with Shaw. Yeah. So I was excited. I signed the contract after speaking to maybe five or six people about this, including te the technicians. The fellow came. He spent the whole day there with me yammering about the dangers of Wi-Fi because he had a cell phone and everything. He knew as he was getting ready to leave, for some reason, my husband pulled out one of our RF meters and it went crazy. So radio frequency, radiation meter that we, you had. I was testing for Wi-Fi. Okay. It went crazy. The, the guy, the fellow, the installer looked at me and he said, what is that? And we said, what did you put in our home? He ran. He literally ran out of our house. We started searching. He had put, he had disconnected every wired 
connection and installed Wi-Fi throughout our home. Without we your... had television, we had internet, everything was Wi-Fi, and we didn't know it. If we didn't have a meter, we would never have known. So what happened after that? I called immediately, and it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, so I got nobody, but I left messages everywhere. The next day, I called. I insisted that they come out that day, remove everything. They did. I told them what had happened. They had no excuse. They presented no argument against it and they removed everything. Why wouldn't they just put a, a, a wired router into your home? Good question. I don't know. My, I suspect that I am the oddity. Yeah. And they don't expect people not to have Wi-Fi. So when they tell you they're bringing in fiber optics, they really aren't because it's the last mile that makes the difference. Yeah. If you don't have fiber optics in your home, you're not going to get that additional speed. It's not going to make, it may make a minor bit of difference, but it's yeah. not going to make that big a difference in speed. What they're really doing is they're bringing fiber optics up the street in preparation for the 5G technology. Okay, so now the, you bring a fiber optic cable up the street, you have what's essentially a router out on the pole now, with the new 5G. Well, a transmitter. Or a transmitter, right? Yes. And. Uh, so now, what are they going to be transmitting at the house? Are they going to be transmitting movies, for instance? or? So far, what they're telling is it's going to be for downloading, for downloading movies, for downloading Wi-Fi. Yeah. The demand, supposedly, is for, so for the smartphones, all these other things. But when you read the data, when you read the propaganda, it's going to be connecting to everything. It's the backbone of the Internet of Things. People have probably okay. seen IoT. The Internet of Things is the coming attraction yeah. for everyone. Everything in your home is soon going to have a smart device in it. So this is related to the smart meters too then? Yes, to the smart meters, to your smart TV, to every new appliance you get that has a smart chip in it. A Zigbee chip is in the smart meter right now and it has not been activated yet. But when TELUS or when Hydro does activate it, it will be connecting with all of your smart devices and it will be gathering data on you, your usage, everything about that's going on in your home. And it's going to be shipping it to the smart meter, to the Zigbee chip. And this is going to be shared through the Internet of Things, through the fifth ge uh, generation technology that's being built. Now where is that information going? Like is it going back to the TELUS, it's uh, the operator? They're building huge data centers. Yeah. I don't know where it's going. But one of my concerns, Walt, is that these transmitters, right now they're using 4G and 3G because the 5G is only in pilot project status. Mm -hmm. But when you look, at to, look to see who's building the transmitters and who's working on the pilot project with TELUS in Vancouver, it's a Chinese government affiliated company called Huawei, H-U-A-W-E-I. Mm -hmm. This company, has been found to, and it is said it is guilty of cyber espionage. Intelligence agencies around the world, Australian, French, the UK, American, Canadian, all of them are warning to avoid Huawei and Z, a Z, a ZTE, which are two um, Chinese companies that are involved in all the telecommunication infrastructure deals. That is so peculiar because uh, you'd wonder what they could bring to the game that we wouldn't have for technology here but ourselves. I doubt they can bring anything. It's uh, probably cost. But the yeah. thing is, they're going to have access to our infrastructure. Yeah. And the, and the agencies, the intelligence agencies are saying, don't. Yeah. Don't buy their cell phones. But if you go into any of the cell phone companies, for instance, I was in Best Buy the other day, they're selling away cell phones. Those cell phones are going to gather data of, from any call you make, and it's being sent back to China. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that the same thing is going to happen. Now, you know that people like James Woosley and other people, inter, um, intelligence agency director experts, of the CIA. Yeah. James Woosley, the former director of the CIA, has been warning that there's going to be a major attack yeah. on the infrastructures in North America. It's not going to have to be, you know, it's war with nuclear bombs. They're going to take over the grid. 
And when they bring yeah. our power grids down, we have nothing. Right. We don't. We can't get gas. We can't get food. Our money. We can't get our money. I mean, there's. There is going to be a major you consequence. Know, that's like, like, see, we don't really think about the macro part of it. Of course, my concern was, oh, we have uh, a foreign company involved in in installing technology. Possibly in my home, it would be a hard job for them ever to get near me. But in most homes, and. They could be collecting data. Now you could say, oh, well, they, are, they just want to know what you're consuming, what your lifestyle is, and they'll be manufacturing products. And a lot of people could sort of slough it off as that. Whereas others may say, well, really, they are monitoring everything you do because everything in your house, everything you do, is something has associated with using electricity from turning lights on to turning on different appliances. Yes. And they could really get a profile of you of, of your lifestyle, basically. They're getting profiles of people, but what's more damaging and what's scarier is they're getting a profile of the entire grid. Yeah. They, they are working with the companies that are building our infrastructure. Yeah. And to what end? Why? Why is the government allowing it? Yeah. Why is CRTC allowing it? Why is TELUS allowing it? I've written to the board of directors. Yeah. No comment. No comment at all of the board of directors of TELUS. Yes. Okay, so, I mean, this is sort of what we, you know, uh, maybe several years ago, when we did talk about the rollout of, of this, the new technology. And it, this seems to be the end game. This is what they're, they finally are arriving to, where you just have like a complete integration. Now I'm wondering, would uh, those transmitters be useful in self-driving cars, for yes. instance? Yes, yes, self-driving cars. All sorts of things. This is why they're promoting them. It's yeah. going to increase your convenience. It's going to increase your safety. It's going to, you know, they, they build the justification up so that people, you know, who are already hooked, they're addicted to these wireless things. Yeah. And it just appeal, appeals to people. But the fact of the matter is, the consequences are grave. Now, even if they want to go ahead with the 5G, why do they have to do it in connection with a company that has been found guilty of cyber espionage. I don't understand that. It seems like we're putting the fox in charge of the hen house here. You know, and it seems that our elected officials just seem to have lost all common sense. I mean, these are sort of the things that you, anybody would be checking just, just with, for just... Well, not necessarily. Tell us it's a private company. Uh -huh. Why would our elected officials have anything to do with it? Yeah. The only strength we have and there is a level. It's at the, pro at the lower level, municipal level. Yeah. These things are being put on our right-of-ways, okay. along our streets. They're being put up on places where, really, the municipalities give the easements to the province for essential services. Okay. Is this an essential service? I argue it isn't. Yeah. So we should be going to our local councils, to our municipalities, and say, no, don't allow it. This is interesting because of the nature of, if you're talking about uh, telephone lines, hard, hardwired telephone lines, or electricity to our homes, you could see where these types of things are a necessity for our health and safety. Uh, but wireless technology is not really bringing anything new in that department. No. For, you know, there's a telephone handy if you need to make a call. And of course, the well, as a matter of fact, they're taking the landlines out. Yeah, this is the problem. They're replacing them with with either wireless. They're assuming everyone has a wireless one. Yeah. Or they're putting ones in that have batteries that wear down after a few hours. Now, where do you see this all going? Do you think that uh, there's any chance if, uh, if somebody had a concern, who might we want to address? Who would we send a a message to, and uh, somebody with an authority that could do something about it? I think what we people need to do is to get active here and start writing to tell us yeah. complain to tell us first and foremost into their board of directors second they need to be going to their local municipalities we sh we are not being told that this is being put out in front of yeah. our home this is emitting radiation into our homes 24/7 yeah. and it's 15 or 18 feet away from bedroom windows and it's a uh ongoing exposure too. It's constant. Yeah. It's not like a cell phone that you can turn off. It's not like a smart meter where you can move away from it and, and reduce it with distance. And they are going to be using phased array antenna, 
which are very, very strong because the beam is so, so weak. They're going to be bringing in a new beam technology that is going to make it stronger so okay. that it can go through the walls of your home. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to. And they're aiming that at our houses. Yes, they're aiming it at our homes. And they're not telling us. It, they're going to the city yeah. and they're saying that because we're putting it on an existing structure, we don't have to tell anybody. Yeah. Well, the city has some control. This is our public right of way. Yeah. And we're hoping to be able to get something before the Union of BC Municipalities this fall so that the municipalities will know that they have the right to say no. They should look at the contracts they're signing yeah. and say no, they can. Now, who's collecting fees for all these uh, transmitters mounted? Uh, they're mounted on hydro poles or what are Most they mounted? Most of them are on hydro poles. So the, they would have to have a contract with BC Hydro. Yes. So well, see, they're getting the power from BC Hydro. They're getting the fiber optic cable from BC Hydro. Okay. And they're powering up their they're amplifiers up. and yeah. all that on the street off of those power poles. Yeah. TELUS and Hydro are working together on this, as is Hawaii. Right. Now, I imagine there are some government uh, grants and money involved. Have you ever looked into that? Trying Haven't to figure yet. that out? Nope. Trying to follow the money is difficult, as you well know. Yeah. And I think that the money is second to the security and to the health yeah. issue. And I think that I don't know yet. I mean, I've just started this long, twisted, convoluted trail. Yeah. And there are other people who are working more directly with it than I am. Yeah. And I think that, you know, between us, we're going to find out exactly what's going on. This is the backbone of the new, quote, smart city. Right. That you've heard so much about. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, we've gone through a lot with uh, lobbyists in other areas, especially in the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry and uh, in, the, in the oil industry, and you see that they're able to really have a huge uh, sway over our, not only our elected politicians and our elected representatives, but more importantly, the bureaucracy within the government, because they have spent years rubbing elbows with a lot of these people, and uh, for them it's very easy to steer things in a way that may not be apparent to, uh, to the citizens of the province exactly what's happening. More than that, they're steering the science yeah. in the wrong direction. They're hiding the science. So as far as health is concerned, the evidence is there, but yeah. no one knows it. And there, there is a, I think that there probably is a money trail. Yeah. It may include the government. It probably does include some levels of government. Yeah. But I think also the CRTC, some of the federal bodies are involved here. Yeah. So we're going to have to leave that at, uh, leave us uh, right at that right now, Sharon. Uh, now, I just want to reiterate, if people want to get more information regarding the 5G rollout, uh, should they go to the, uh, to the website, to your website? We're, we're only starting. We're going to try. Uh, someone is building a new website okay. devoted to 5G. But there is an excellent 5G uh, website in the U.S. It's called, if you go in and Google 5G information. Yeah. You can get it. It's it's run by Kate Keel, K H E E L, and she's done a super job putting things together. Okay. Down in the U.S., it's different. She, they're facing some of the different legislative things than we are. Yeah. But um, as far as learning more about 5G, I would say go there now for the basic information. Yeah. And if you have questions, certainly go to our website, and we'll be more than happy to provide any information or contact information. Okay. So thanks so much for coming in, and You're hopefully we'll have you back Thank soon. You. Thank you. So that uh, finishes off this segment of Citizens Day. Welcome back. And this segment of the show is the Jack and Walt segment in which we look at the current events of the week and try to make some sense out of it. So, uh, Jack, um, what have you brought in today that you want to talk about? Well, uh, item number one, can the CBC be trusted? Uh, should we trust the CBC? And, you know, I get a lot of flack when I criticize the CBC. Um, and that's because people really do trust the CBC, yeah. you know. And that's why the CBC is so valuable, because people really do trust the CBC, which allows them to betray us even more, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's, I take this issue that Sharon Noble was just talking about. Yeah. Where is the CBC on that? I mean, people's health, people's privacy, a, a lot of important issues there. The CBC is that. Where is the CBC on 
the absolute climate change disaster. Yeah. I mean, we are in such trouble. But the CBC is more concerned about the, you know, the, how the Maple Leafs are doing. Than yeah, I mean, the, the, the CBC is a big corporation. There are a lot of good things happening within the corporation. This has nothing to do, I'm not in any way negative about anybody who works for the CBC. Yeah. This is the, this is their job. They have to do it to us because if they don't, they'll get fired. Now, here's something that, you know, I've been thinking about is, you know, of course, the Donald Trump era is on us the last few years. And the, the picture that's being painted is Donald Trump is just full of BS. Everything he says is wrong. And the corporate media, on the other hand, who's covering Donald Trump are all fact-based and they don't have any agenda. And they're, they're, they're the, the people that are going to save us from Donald Trump. Now, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but I can see where how the corporate media, particularly media like the CBC, holds themselves up to such high standards, they think, uh, that they can, they just seem to think that uh, the public should just buy into this. When you see the CBC has a lot of bias themselves and so many issues, particularly around covering the pipeline, uh, the pipelines debate, uh, around uh, the Site C Dam, you get this coverage that's, that's not fair and square, but it's hard to figure it out. Like today on, this, on the CBC on the news today, they have the protesters hanging off the Iron Workers Bridge in Vancouver, uh, trying to stop the tankers from flowing under, and it's a, they're, they're being successful. They've been there for 35 hours now. And uh, you see where the CBC is not really fathoming exactly why they're doing this. They're, uh, they're interviewing people that are opposed to the pipeline, people on the street that are quite, you know, quite emotionally involved and in really think the pipeline's a bad idea, but they're not offering a lot of good concrete rationale or anything. And on the other side, they're interviewing the oil execs and the consultants and the lobbyists that think that uh, the pipeline is in the national interest of Canada and, and uh, there's a big, big economic benefits and all that, which anyone who's done any research knows that's completely not true. Yeah, they're allowed, anybody is allowed to lie in the media and get away with it. You can yeah. say whatever you want, depending on if, if you're But they go unchallenged on CBC. Unchallenged. So here we have the CBC looking like it's fair and balanced and doing all the nice and right things, but in fact, they're subverting the, the, uh, the process by, by this hidden bias. It's never ending. I, I don't know how we're gonna pull ourselves out of it. Uh, next on the list is gas prices and gouging. So, I mean, that's another thing. All the media, I don't wanna pick on the CBC, but all the media. The, the, why are gas prices so high? Why doesn't the media ask that question? Why doesn't the media lead a charge against the gas companies and the yeah. oil companies and bring the price of gas? Or at least, if we're going to be paying high prices for gas, which we should, at least the money should be going to ourselves, into government coffers where it can hopefully be spent in some good way. But no, the gas companies raise the price 10 cents a liter, 20 cents a liter. Oh, well, it's market forces, it's this, it's that. You know, BS, We're, we are being ripped <laughs> off, and it's allowed. And it, you know, it doesn't matter what political stripe you think you, you, think you belong to. This is, this is criminal. They shouldn't be getting away with this. But it just goes on and on, and we don't really get a lot of, you know, well, our, we think our local politicians or MLAs might come up the bat and say, okay, enough is enough. But we don't hear any of that language at all. We're no, just paying no through way. the nose. Now, the, there's a, there is a carbon tax on fuel. I mean, there's a couple cents per liter that uh, is supposed to be a carbon tax, which is supposed to go towards improving uh, our lifestyle. But the carbon tax, as far as I know, doesn't go into any spe specific uh, fund. It goes into the general revenues of the province, and which all gets lost in, <laughs> in their budget, you know. So we really are not seeing any great improvement with that. Uh, the fish farms. So a couple of weeks ago now, the NDP, John Horgan, decided to give the fish farm, 20 licenses were up for renewal. This is, the fish farms are an absolute disaster 
for the oceans, for, for everything. I mean, the, the fish, I wouldn't eat the fish. Mm -hmm. And yet it was done in such a way as it was presented almost as a good thing by the media and by the NDP. I mean, what a betrayal of so many hundreds of thousands of people who really want something better for the NDP to just, 20 licenses were up for renewal, they extended them all. Yeah. And, and, and it just disappeared as a story within a couple of days. You know, the Federal Department of Fisheries, if you look at their actions around the testing of diseases on in farm salmon, and if you don't think that this is pretty close to criminal activity, I don't know what is. You know, these are supposed to be government uh, experts that are supposed to be looking at these diseases. Now, everybody else is finding these diseases except our government, our federal government. And uh, because they have the jurisdiction, the provinces are relying on the federal government to do the testing. The provinces is not doing the testing. And this is the one crucial thing that we all have to know that everywhere in the world where we have these open pen salmon farms, there's diseases everywhere in the pens and also occurring with the fish swimming by. That's why they don't have salmon farms in Norway <laughs> and why we have all these Norwegian salmon farms in Canada. So, I mean, that have let this go on this long, Jack. That 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 is something really serious, and and uh, we have to we have to get something changed there. Well, we have to deal with the fact that in Canada, the politicians and the media are corporate controlled. They work together against us, and we're out of time. Okay, so that uh, completes this segment of Citizens Watch. Welcome back to the Citizens Forum, and. Uh, for this segment, we're going to be talking about proportional representation and trying to think about, well, how is it going to look after we uh, have this uh, victory on the proportional representation? How is it going to play out when uh, we're looking at how uh, the new, new regime for political parties is going to be, how the parties are going to be acting, and uh, how, we, how we are we're going to see this in the next, before the next election, basically how people are going to be getting organized. Now we have with us today Kaylin Harris, and Kaylin's quite well known for his uh, advocacy for uh, proportional representation. Welcome to the show, Kaylin. Thank you, sir. And um, we just talked a little bit just now about this, and since I'm the, I'm the, in the chair here, I'm going to ask you this question, and Jack also, uh, and that is, you know, my concern has been over the years is looking at political parties and seeing how powerful they are, <laughs> and even though you might even have a be supporting a party and some candidates you generally think are a good idea, by the time they go through the grind of the, the whip of the, um, the party and the party's deciding what policy is going to be, they basically almost disappear into the, into the, the mist and you don't know what happened to them. So uh, let's start out with that. Do, we think, do you think that um, political parties are going to gain or lose power. Say, for instance, if we go to a proportional representation system like mixed member proportional representation, do you think they're going to have more power or less after, after that is set up? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a big question, and uh, I don't know that we have the, the yeah. time to, to get right into it. But like, let's just start right now. I mean, you, you make a fair point that the parties do have a fair lot of com uh, control over the system right now. Uh, for example, the axing the tolls on the bridges in the Lower Mainland, was uh, that was a call that was made by the uh, party operative in the NDP, um, and that set us down a path where they had to approve Site C. They, you know, they're, they're looking at other sources of revenue, uh, and, uh, and you know, there's all sorts of other uh, kind of There never was any real public debate on that. They just came up with that policy and off they went. Exactly. That was not a, it held in a, a, um, a policy convention. They, they didn't have a conversation about it. It was a call from a, a guy in the back office. Wow. So none of the politicians knew about it. They got a memo and they ran with it. Yeah. Worked for them. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of lower mainland voters that say that it would work for them as well. But, um, you know, is it democratic? I don't know. Um, now, the, you're looking at changing the system, and now what we uh, what we have potentially with mixed member uh, or multi member uh, or mixed member proportional representation um, is um, generally an opportunity because we are going to likely end up with something that still has regional representation, so that we have a very clear understanding of who our MLA or MLAs are. Um, 
the likelihood that we will have um, a situation where parties will be forced to collaborate with um, other parties in that their own backyard yeah. um, suggests that then that partisan um, fervor that comes with the system we've got now will go the way of the dodo because um, yeah. anybody who just you know stands there as, as stubborn as a donkey and says you know it's my way or the highway. Well, you're dealing with um, another articulate, thoughtful individual yeah. who's, who has a, a broad public support in your own backyard. Um, all of a sudden, you're going to look perhaps a little bit silly. Yeah. So I think uh, with a lot of our proportional systems that are on, on available, that kind of dynamic is going to play out regularly. Yeah. So there's less of a threat, perhaps, to people who want to represent their constituents and, well, and the interests of their constituents over the interests of the party, and they might be able to do that more comfortably. 100%. Actually, you're, uh, I had a conversation with Stephen Hurdle, who's a, a researcher for Fair Vote um, Canada on this program uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, the, that very point came up, is that uh, under um, one, of the others, one of the systems being proposed, dual member, uh, proportional, um, it actually empowers independence a lot, um, so that, um, and that independence, that, that thrust of independence will, um, will, will kind of create independent thinkers across the political spectrum. I think yeah. um, when you have constituencies who are really well served by independent thinkers, they will consistently reelect those people. And you see that in Delta where, um, I forget the lady's name, but she, you know, she, she was uh, the MLA there for a dozen years or yeah. so. Um, and was really well uh, received, and you know when she decided to retire, everybody was quite upset. Yeah. Um, so when you see, I mean, even Andrew Weaver, who stood as uh, an independent, quote unquote, as representative of the Greens for Oak Bay, um, Gordon Head, he also uh, stood very, very strongly for his constituents, um, and actually did very well regionally to represent the interests of people uh, that were not being well represented by either the governing party or the opposition party that was doing its best just to get in the way of the governing party. And you can see that that's a better measurement of the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, accomplishments of, of the, the, the elected member is to look at what the uh, policy or the uh, platform was in the election and what things that happened during their term that, that they made good decisions and, and therefore people would like to vote whether they like that or not, oh, as opposed to just looking at a big party and saying, I want to be you know, one of the parties. Well, that's kind of the hope, right? And of course, with, um, with this kind of focus on regional elected officials, and I mean, as much as we like to think that we do 87 elections and we've got uh, you know, all of our individual representatives, we know that um, majority of uh, British Columbians and voters will just look at you know, party X, party Y, party Z, yeah. cast their ballot that way, just given on you know, their own personal history with the, the party, the, their, their familial history with the party, um, whether or not there's been some sort of scandal, uh, how the media has been portray portraying everything. Um, and so I think what this does is it does actually allow for a little bit more of a, a personal approach to, 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 uh, to reading your MLA's uh, performance. Right. And it doesn't necessarily have to come down to platforms. I think really it allows you to say, you know, did I like, do I agree with this person's decision over and over again? Um, and if on the balance I didn't agree with what they did, then I actually have a valid option at voting some, for somebody else. And, and that, to be fair, in the province right now, there's a lot of safe seats out there. There are yeah. a lot of seats that are very rarely contested by anybody. Yeah. And so to give, to mix it up a little bit, I think puts politicians on uh, on notice. And I think, you know, the majority, again, the majority of British Columbians, I've spoken to thousands of people over the last uh, few years um, through, you know, my old business and um, and then knocking on doors uh, for various reasons. Um, and the majority of people have problems with politicians. Not, yeah. <laughs> they, they, with politicians, a dirty word. And yeah. there's a good reason for it. And it's because they tend to not do what they say they're going to do. And then they make excuses or equivocate when uh, they can't get it done. Um, and of course, everybody's angry, not necessarily because a politician did what a politician did, but because there's no alternative. Yeah, it's and so, so frustrating. Yeah. So I think we have an opportunity yeah. here with, this, with the referendum to, to really mix things up, uh, shake up the political uh, landscape so that um, <clears throat> another beast, another type of animal has the opportunity to come to the fore in a different ecosystem altogether. Yeah. I think that's kind of my favorite analogy right now is that we've created a political environment where a certain type of apex predator functions. It's a, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a populist, you know, glad handing, uh, door knocking, fundraising kind of uh, politician. Well, 
all of the, the you know, contemplative, the, the thoughtful, the, the, the collaborative, the cooperative, yeah. um, real, you know, community builders are left to the side of the streets because they, they, they don't want to take the microphone. They don't want to stand up front and say, hey guys, I've yeah. got um, at least the will to work with the, the majority of British Columbians to make sure that we come out come out with a policy that we, we can all at least be satisfied with. Yeah. And, and not just push everybody that's not in the majority to the margins. Because yeah. I think British Columbians, again, are fairly inclusive people. We want to see more people on board. We want to hear more voices. And I think uh, this system has proven time and time again that it's not capable of doing that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think, Jack? Do you, do you? I'll answer your question. Too. <laughs> sure. Okay. I think uh, if we get proportional voting, um, the political parties will have less power. But also, the amount of power the political parties have can be determined, it really has to be determined outside of the voting system. The voting system and a proportional voting system, I think, are going to give people a little more power and the corporations and the politicians a little less power. But in order to weaken the political parties, uh, we can do that just by creating rules that say, for example, the party leader does not have as much power as he now has or she now has. Because in our system, the the party leaders have literally the powers of dictators. They can decide who's going to be a candidate and who isn't going to be a candidate. They can decide that, and they can also decide if you dare to stand against them on any important mm -hmm. issue. If any NDP MLA, for example, would stand against the party leader on any important issue, or liberal, that, party, that person would be removed from the caucus immediately, and their career would be over. None of them want that. So we've got to change those rules to give the individual MLAs more power and also to give especially the voters and the citizens more power and remove some power from the party leadership and the backroom. So that wouldn't girls. be done with legislation. Couldn't you just have legislation to say that? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now let's be, let's, let's be honest here. That, that system, or that, that um, ecosystem that you're talking about, that, that set of circumstances, um, I would argue is a, a result of the current system. Um, you need party discipline because uh, if you don't, uh, if you if you disagree, then you know your government could be in in uh, in, um, in, in in peril. Uh, the the opposition will you know use it to drive a wedge yeah. into the party and talk about how in disarray your party is, and then you'll you're, you'll lose all opportunity at full and total com country or complete yeah. power. And so I I mean I I'm gonna necessarily I'm not gonna necessarily say that more rules are the answer. I would say that um, we need to change the the system with like the entire system, the the ecosystem that these yeah. people operate in. Because if you t change the incentives, then it'll just that'll change. And I don't know that legislation saying you know slap on the wrist if you uh, if you're overly partisan or you're over, yeah. overly um, you know p political in that way. Um, I don't think that's actually going to make any sort of lasting change. Okay. I think it'll just create, it'll push those kinds of nasty behaviors into dark corners and closed rooms. Yeah. And, I, and I think, so that's where I think this, it's really important that we talk about ecosystem change or environment change that will actually just change the, the, the political calculus or like the, the behavioral calculus for politicians and political actors. Yeah. Um, we've noticed over the last couple of weeks a very, very well-funded uh, and led by some pretty heavy hitters mm -hmm. uh, campaign to say we don't want proportional representation. And I think, I hope when people see the huge amounts of money that are being spent, they've purchased the front page of the Vancouver Sun and the Vancouver Province a couple of times, mm -hmm. at least, full page ads, I think in our local TC and uh, in a lot of the regional papers as well. Um, I mean, that's happening. What do you think? The, can, we, can we tell the public that, hey, look who's opposed to PR, and uh, that should make you think that you should be for it? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty sound argument, as I'd, I'd characterize it, is that um, when you have uh, the big dogs uh, barking and saying, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is not the change that we're looking for, um, the status quo is, uh, is very good for some people. And so I think... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think those um, those circles of power that um, that that are always at work in our province, um, they are 
still in power and they're still going to want to stay in power and so the status quo is working for them and I, I think they honestly see a change in the the way that our province will work and it will become more democratic and it will be harder to get your own way um, and uh, I think that's why they're throwing they have thrown as much money as, the, as they have yeah. at this and I think um, that's why all of these big players who've done really well uh, for themselves in this system are coming out very very strongly against this um, I think the, the, the challenge is going to be to uh, ask British Columbians whether or not um, they are okay with a pater paternalistic yeah. government and, a, and, a, and an idea that, oh, we know what's better for you than, than you do. Um, yeah. And I think, again, because of the, the way that people use the term polit uh, politician as a pejorative, I think most people would honestly, if they were to ask themselves honestly, would say, no, nah, I, I don't like those guys telling me what's right for me. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Is the referendum binding? Does My understanding is that uh, regardless of participation, if it's 50% yeah. 50, 50 plus one, uh, the NDP are going to roll, roll with it. Yeah. That being said, they have put a condition on it, suggesting that uh, if the government were to fall before July 31st, 2021, oh. uh, that any uh, election before that would be under first past the post still. So they want to give uh, elections BC until after that date, so August 1st, uh, to get their ducks in order. Now, just is, would it be a possible scenario where uh, the NDP would lose the election, where the, maybe the Liberals would win, and the Liberals could just step up and say, no, we're not going to do that? Is that a possible scenario? Well, I, I mean, it's, it's possible. You know, the, par uh, the, the supremacy of, uh, of Parliament is still a thing here in the province. And um, that being said, though, I think it would be political suicide. If it were to pass, 50% yeah. uh, plus one of British Columbians say, we want to change, and they say, no, we know it's good for you. Um, I think uh, that it would be political suicide. Especially with the experiences we've had with past referendums when, in fact, I think we did actually win one the we did. early on, and we, yeah. we couldn't have it because they had said the, we need a 60% instead of 50%. So that's going to wrap up the show for this week, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be your host, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.